Okay, the topic for today is Jesus and Judaism, uh, which is a topic that can go in a number of different uh, directions. Uh, and so I picked three or so of those many different directions. Um, and part of it is to start out that any any time we're talking about Judaism, there's a history there. And we hear it um, in the context of that history because we're shaped by it. And so do Jews. So Jews sometimes read the New Testament and they read different things than we do. They hear different things. Um, for instance, if you are reading about the, um, uh, the Good Samaritan and you are a Levite, a Levite generation, you read that a little differently than we do. If you read the Exodus story and you're Egyptian, you read it a little differently than we do. Um, so the, the history is a history of antagonism that got much more severe after the Crusades or during the Crusades. There was discrimination uh, between against Jews. Christians had dominance after Constantine, fourth century, uh, and there were discriminations, limitations on what Jews could do. With the Crusades, things changed dramatically. Many of the Crusader armies on their way to the Middle East, uh, stopped off in some cities and massacred Jews. So it became far more intense. And so you see um, representatives, uh, representations of that in cathedrals, um, in other art from the uh, late Middle Ages. So here you see representations of the church and the chained uh, synagogue. In other places, on cathedrals, you can see Jews represented as pigs, the Judensal, the Jewish pig. <clears throat> and you have uh, invective coming from even the likes of Martin Luther. Uh, what you have in the handout, where uh, Martin Luther writes, no Christians, that next to the devil, you have no enemy more cruel, more venomous, more violent than a true Jew. So what Christians should we do with this rejecting against people? And he gives four things that you should do. Uh, set fire to their synagogues. Uh, their house, destroy their houses. Uh, destroy their prayer books and all their other uh, writings. And uh, forbid the rabbis from teaching. Now, this isn't entirely representative of Luther. He had other writings of, of Jews that were maybe not sympathetic, maybe not positive, but certainly not as violent as this. So I picked out a, uh, one of the more violent, maybe the most violent writing of his. But you find some writings in various other uh, uh, Christian authors. I actually don't know what Calvin wrote uh, about Jews. It is likely not to have been really positive. It is likely not to have been as negative as this. Um, so many of the themes, the anti-Semitic themes, have been there through throughout centuries. Um, there is some Jewish invective against Christianity. So you have a, a medieval text called uh, Toledo Yeshu, uh, the story of Jesus, that pulls out some of the accusations of, against Jesus, such as that he was uh, the illegitimate son of a centurion and Mary, so Joseph was not even his biological father. And these come from very early texts. So it's not that they're making this up, uh, but there's actually a little hint in the Gospels of accusations against Mary that <coughs> there was a, a 
father other than Joseph uh, to Jesus. And uh, some of these uh, same tropes, ideas come up in Islamic literature uh, as well. So what, what has happened then is that even though the Gospels are very clear that Jesus was a Jew, that he has been presented through the ages as a non-Jew, as the un-Jew. Uh, and he, the Gospels and some of Paul have been read against Judaism. So he is the Jew that criticizes Judaism, and therefore he becomes, in a sense, depicted as a non-Jew. So the Gospels are clear that he's a rabbi, but that quickly gets in our consciousness, in the consciousness of most Christians, gets, gets put to the side. <clears throat> so, um, so these various I ideas are presented as contrast to Judaism. He speaks with women, but Jews really don't. Uh, he cares for the poor, but Jews really don't. They care about money. Uh, he adapts the law, the Pharisees and the uh, Sadducees and the scribes, they hew to the law, law precisely. He's uh, they're all concerned about purity. He's not so concerned about purity. He's more concerned about relationships. So there are all these contrasts that are drawn up. Some of them are, uh, they're not inherent in the Gospels, but they are the ways we read the Gospels, and they're the ways we preach on the Gospels. One of the dangers of doing this particular exploration your pastor's not in here, is he? <laughs> now, I was a pastor for 12 years, a uh, full-time pastor in churches in Massachusetts. And when I started reading this material, I was embarrassed about the things that I had been preaching for years. And one of the dangers of doing this is that we in our seminaries are trained to read these stories kind of with these... Um, understandings. And so most of <coughs> us preach with these understandings. And, but they're likely to be wrong. Some of them are clearly wrong. Uh, some of them are probably wrong. And so if you then go into church after this and you hear something that I've said is wrong, don't tell me. <laughs> tell the pastor, but don't tell the pastor that I said. <laughs> The Gospels contain problems, uh, problematic verses for Jews. Uh, there are condemnations in the Jews. One has to realize that the Gospels weren't written at the time of Jesus. They were written a good bit later. They were written, for the most part, there's questions about Mark, for the most part after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And after that period, and I think I made quick reference to this last week, the Jewish and, and Christian communities began to grow apart. And there was increasing criticism and antagonism uh, between them because both were claiming a, a common tradition and a correct interpretation of that tradition, but their interpretations were, were different. And so, there, it is likely, there's some reference in the Jewish tradition to the Benin uh, heretics. And it's likely that what they were talking about were the Christians, those who claimed, made the claim that the Messiah had actually come. So the fundamental difference between Jews and Christians is that Christians believe that the Messiah has come in the form of Jesus, uh, the Christ, the Messiah, and Jews do not. So it's a joke that goes around that when, when in the second coming, Jesus will either say, it's nice to be back, or it's nice to finally get here, and then we'll know who's right. <laughs> so, um, so these Gospels were written at a time 
when the life of Jesus was looked at through the lens of a current context of the Gospel writer in which there was tension. <clears throat> and that comes through in some of the texts. So, you, so we read these kinds of passages and then we read them uh, against uh, other passages which show um, a great deal of commonality with the Jews. Uh, in fact, that show that Jesus was a normal, practicing Jew, and he was not the un-Jew. So there's a tension there, and there's no easy solution to that. So it's a question of how these passages are used and interpreted, how we read them and the complexity of uh, tensions. And you add Paul in here, and it gets even more complicated. Because Paul was clearly a Jew. He was a Pharisee. He says that in, the gospel, in, the, in his letters. Um, but he was also trying to deal with a, with a complex situation that has been read by scholars in a variety of different ways, of trying to both affirm Judaism, and at the same time affirm uh, a Gentile Christianity. The Gentiles were not second-class citizens in this ancient religion, that they were grafted in in some ways, and reading especially Romans 9 through 11, um, scholars have struggled with that portion of text where he's discussing uh, the relationship of Gentiles and Jews and the two covenants. Uh, and what he says is very confusing. And so it's a little difficult to know how uh, Paul is nuancing this, except that he <clears throat> does not want Gentiles to be subservient or less legitimate, less authentic. Uh, than Jews in the eyes of God. So, uh, <clears throat> this uh, passage from Matthew uh, called the blood curse has been one of the uh, most used or misused passages against Jews. This idea, his blood curse be upon us all. Uh, his blood be the responsibility for the death of Jesus be on us all. Is been, has been taken as a basis for the accusation that the Jews are Christ killers. And that accusation has been there for two millennia. Uh, in actuality, we know that it was the Romans who killed Jesus, not the Jews, but there was a leadership of the Jews, certainly in the Sanhedrin, who were complicit uh, in this in some way. Uh, <clears throat> And how to regard that is, again, this is a big question that we struggle with. Um, that slide wasn't in your outline. I put it in there. The outlines are always a little out of date, because I keep dickering. <laughs> so, how do we know that um, Jesus was a, um, a practicing Jew? I mean, we know it says that he was a Jew. But did he have Jewish practice? There are a number of indicators of that. One is that he cites Jewish texts, not only Old Testament texts, texts from Jewish scripture, but um, also particularly the, the Great Commandment um, that appears in all three all um, three Synoptic Gospels. Uh, he also dresses like a Jew. Uh, last time we talked about fringes. Remember the woman with the hemorrhage? She creeps up and touches his, the fringes of his garment. So we wore fringes. Uh, when the Jews are, uh, when they pray, they wear a prayer shawl. Uh, and the prayer shawl is for the purpose of having <coughs> fringes. The shawl itself is unimportant. Uh, although you should cover your head, especially in prayer, and so it can be used to cover the, the head. But its important thing is that it has fringes on the corner, because you're required, according to a passage 
in Deuteronomy, I believe, uh, you're required to wear these fringes. There, there are a certain number of threads, there are a certain number of knots. Symbolically, that all adds up to 613, which is the number of commandments uh, that you believe are in the, uh, in the Jewish Bible. <coughs> so, so we wear fringes, as Jews are supposed to do. Uh, he keeps kosher. Now, this is a little difficulty, difficult because at some place he um, declares all foods clean. But actually, if you look at that passage, he doesn't do that. Uh, Mark does it. Mark puts this uh, phrase in parentheses in which Mark is interpreting what Jesus says, uh, saying, and thus he declared all foods clean. So it's not actually a saying of Jesus. And if he declared all foods clean, then other parts of the scripture would make no sense. In Acts 10, there's this wonderful story of Peter uh, visiting a, a Gentile, Cornelius, and Peter won't eat at the house because it's not kosher food. And if Jesus had declared all foods clean, that story would make no sense at all. Because certainly Peter, as the... Um, foundation of the church would then not worry about eating kosher. Uh, so, um, so it seems that Jesus kept Jewish law of eating kosher. Um, and it was also an issue with the big debate in Jerusalem, the council where Paul and Peter and uh, James' brother of Jesus uh, were all debating whether Gentiles had to keep the law. It emerges as an issue there. Um, and he engaged in Talmudic debate. And this is important. Remember last time, um, last week we talked about the Talmud, one of the most essential documents in Judaism is this monumental collection of Jewish arguments. Uh, and there are arguments about Jewish practice. We talked a bit about the arguments about keeping the Sabbath. How do you keep the Sabbath? Uh, what are, if God says you should do no work on the Sabbath, what is work? Uh, is doing gardening work? Is uh, watching the uh, Dallas Cowboys? That may be anguish, not work. <laughs> so, but, you know, what constitutes work? How do you keep this law. And so there are endless debates about this that, um, and different opinions. And the Talmud is a record of those debates. And one thing about the Talmud that's really interesting is like the Supreme Court, minority opinions are recorded and important. Uh, so you don't have the rabbis agreeing on things. They will disagree, and so it's a record of those disagreements. And they argued about it. So what you have in these passages is Jesus engaging in Talmudic debate, uh, in which majority and minority opinions have some respect. So when we talk about the Pharisees, they were not a unified bunch of people, all in agreement. They were a, a fractious group, and there were, according to some scholars, seven different parties of Pharisees that would, each with a chief rabbi, that they would follow this kind of the, uh, uh, the, the leader, of the, uh, the scholar they would follow, who's thinking they would follow, and there would be constant debates about, among this as they developed an understanding of what Jewish practice is. And Jesus is participating in that kind of debate. And of course, since the Gospel writers are followers of him, they present him as the, the winner of those debates. And indeed, what he represented is also represented as Talmud as legitimate things. <coughs> so a healing a withered hand. Now the question there is, is healing work? Um, and the answer is yes, but then the question is, 
And the example is given, well, if your ox falls into a ditch, do you get it out? Well, and the answer is, yes, you do, because it has to be done then. It can't be left to the next day. Uh, so something that has to be done, especially to save a life, the good and epic, uh, then you do that. Uh, we talked last week about saving a Taurus scroll from a fire. Uh, you can't wait till the next day to do that. You have to do it right then. So the question here is, the man's hand and uh, arm had been withered for many years. Was there an urgency to do it on that at that time? And you could say both ways there. Why have him suffer another day? Uh, there is a certain urgency. On the other hand, there's really no reason that he had to do it then. So that's a Talmudic debate there. Um, and, um, and the same way with the, with the crippled woman. Uh, and actually, in the withered hand, he does no work because it does it by command. Uh, so he just does it verbally. So there's no work involved. With the crippled woman, he touches her. Does that work? Uh, so that's, that's Talmudic debate. And what you see in these and other passages is Jesus engaging in this debate. Nothing that he claimed, with one possible exception, um, is outside normal Jewish spectrum of opinion. And the one that's outside is his prohibition of divorce. Uh, and I think Matthew 10, is it? Um, and that would be pretty unthinkable for, for Jews. Jews accepted that you could get divorced. And to prohibit it, that you don't find that uh, claim in the Talmud. Uh, so I want to go through now seven issues that come up in this, um, in Christian understandings of, of Judaism. Um, and the first is the idea that the law was burdened. A yoke. Uh, and there, is, there are some passages that seem to indicate, Paul uh, presented at times the law as a yoke, and yet he followed the law. Uh, he makes it quite clear that he followed the law. So the idea that it was a, a heavy burden is questionable. It certainly, as an outsider, if you look at it, it seems horribly burdensome. Uh, if you've been doing it all your life, then it's really not a great burden at all, especially if you're in a society which supports it. So if I were to try to start practicing um, uh, kosher, and following the Jews in the Sabbath law, it would be hugely difficult for me. But if you're in a society in which everybody does that, and you've grown up doing it, so the rules are second nature, then it's not hard at all. Uh, it's kind of like you're doing a diet. You know, if you try to do a diet, change a lot of your behavior what you eat, exercising, how you, how you organize your time. It's really difficult. If you've been doing this all your life, or for a long time, for years, having a certain regimen, it's not hard at all. So, um, and he says in the Sermon on the Mount, not a jot or a tittle is removed from the law. So he's fairly clear there that the law remains. Uh, jot or tittle are actually the, the small marks uh, that are vowels, vowel indicators in the Hebrew script. So not a comma or a period is the equivalent. Uh, so the second claim is that the Jews wanted a warrior uh, Messiah, one who would come in and defeat the Romans and establish a Jewish state, or a Jewish rule, restore a Jewish rule. And uh, Jesus was a peaceful, nonviolent uh, person. 
in fact, Jewish ideas of the Messiah were all over the place. They, some expected a warrior Messiah. Some expected a priestly Messiah. Uh, some expected a, a nonviolent Messiah. Some were not particularly concerned about Messiah expectation at all. You know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, who knows? So why worry about it? And so there was no single understanding of what the Messiah was. Uh, it was a, a subject of debate. <clears throat> Jewish resistance to the Roman Empire was mostly nonviolent, um, which made sense because they could not, uh, fighting against the Roman Empire did not make a whole lot of sense. Nevertheless, a Jewish war broke, broke out in 66 AD uh, and went for four years against the Emperor Titus. And uh, the Romans finally sent in the force to put down this rebellion. And in 70 AD, they succeeded and they destroyed uh, the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, there was another revolt that broke out in 133 uh, AD, and there was a messianic figure, Bar Kokhba, which means the son of a star. Uh, and that war went on for two or three years, famously ended at, with the last holdout at Masada, the fortress of Masada, Herod's fortress. And um, it also defeated in the aftermath of that all Jews were uh, kicked out of Jerusalem and forbidden to be in Jerusalem. <coughs> and more of Jerusalem was, was destroyed. Um, so there are famous instances, though, where Romans made a move, for instance, to bring Roman standards, flags, um, into the temple area um, as really an act of provocation or to install a statue of the Caesar in the temple area. And Jews resisted, um, and the, um, it wasn't Pilate, it was somebody before Pilate, said, um, uh, we will kill you all uh, if you resisted. And the Jews all bowed down and exposed their neck. And so we backed down. And there are repeated stories like that of nonviolent Resistance. So that was very much in the spectrum of Jewish responses. So uh, Jesus was not exceptional in advocating, to the extent that he did, uh, nonviolence. Um, a third, um, that uh, Jesus was exceptionally open to women. Cited his relationship with Mary Magdalene or Mary and Martha or uh, the Samaritan woman, uh, Samaritan woman in particular. But um, the Samaritan woman story can be, and I think should be understood differently from the way it uh, commonly is. There are lots of women at the well stories, well stories, especially in the book of Genesis. It was a common trope, a common theme, um, a meme perhaps, in a Jewish narrative to have people meet at wells. So there's nothing unusual. There's nothing really unusual about a woman coming out in midday to uh, get water. The key thing here is not that she was a woman, but that she was Samaritan. Uh, Samaritans and Jews did not like each other. Samaritans, the Samaritans were a people generally understood to be a people who did not uh, go to Babylon the exile uh, and that retained an old uh, tradition of worshiping at Mount Gerizim, which is north of Jerusalem, and was one of the early shrines that were established in the period of the Judges. And the Samaritans retain uh, worship on that site. And especially when Jerusalem was destroyed, 
by the Babylonians. They maintained and continued worship out Mount, at Mount Gerizim. When the Jews came back from Babylon, they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem and claimed that uh, that's the place where Jews were. And the Samaritans didn't follow along with that. They also brought back from Babylon a, a text that we know as the Torah. Uh, Samaritans had their own recension, their own text, which is somewhat different. It's called the uh, Samaritan Torah, the Samaritan Bible. Uh, and it differs in some respects. Um, and it represents probably another um, stream in the development of the Torah, which developed over time. Um, so they kept a separate text, they had a separate place of worship, and both thought the others were illegitimate. <laughs> so um, doesn't happen in Christianity. So you <laughs> <laughs> but um, and so they, they there was a lot of animosity because if they're right, then we're wrong. Uh, and so the dynamic behind this, and it comes out later when Jesus says, you know, you worship in Mount Gerizim, we worship in Jerusalem, and our worship is more legitimate, uh, then uh, it becomes a little clearer that that's what's going on. Uh, she claims that she <coughs> confesses that she's been married seven times. In Judaism, there is no um, prohibition against serial marriage. Uh, divorce is accepted, that's fine. Um, and getting married after you've been divorced, well, that's expected. Seven times, a little much, a little excessive, but, uh, but there's nothing illegal or illegitimate about it. We don't know how, uh, what happened to those uh, marriages. Um, there's an interesting, can't go into this uh, in much detail, the story before the Samaritan uh, woman story is the story of Nicodemus. Uh, you have two encounters with outsiders, uh, and there really is parallel. So I would urge you to sit down, read the story of Nicodemus, which happens at night, read the story of the Samaritan woman, which happens at midday, so they're as different as night and day. <laughs> and yet, they're very, very similar in the kinds of interactions uh, between Jesus instructing this non-Jew as to what the nature of faith is. Uh, they're different foci, but they're really in an interesting juxtaposition. So when you read the Samaritan woman story, you need to read it in the context of the story that's gone before, and the kind of uh, uh, contrast that John is trying to uh, bring out there. Um, uh, two last things. Uh, the very last bit of the Samaritan woman's story is that she runs back to the village. Now, some have claimed that she was an outsider, but it seems when she went back and proclaimed the message of Jesus in the village, that she wasn't an outsider at all. Uh, that the people responded, uh, responded to her. We don't know what, happened, what their conclusion was, but she had a hearing. She was not somebody who was <coughs> respected. Um, and the last note, uh, she wasn't an outsider. Jesus was an outsider. You know, he was in Samaria. He was in her area, uh, not uh, his own. <coughs> so a fourth issue, that Jews are obsessed with purity. There's no question that the Pharisees were concerned with purity laws. Uh, it was part of, uh, part of the tradition that you approach certain things that are holy in a state of purity. That's nothing unusual with Judaism. It tends to be an issue less important in Christianity, in Protestant Christianity, but it's actually very present in Catholic Christianity. So in Catholic Christianity, for instance, a lay person uh, cannot touch that which has been uh, consecrated. So um, the consecrated bread, uh, when you 
go up for the Mass and go up for the Eucharist. Uh, lay people can't touch it. A priest would often lay it on the tongue. You don't take it out uh, the way we do it. Uh, because for us, the bread is not consecrated holy in the way that it is in the Catholic Church. And that's essentially like a purity law. Um, and um, in Judaism, as in some other religions, and it's there in Islam as well, uh, and there in other religions, uh, purity, being in a state of purity, is a matter of a requirement to, for coming into the presence of holiness. Uh, and, but one should not exaggerate uh, the issue of uh, purity. Uh, priests were not pure all the time. They had to be pure in order to go in and do their temple duty. But once they were through with their temple, temple uh, duty, they didn't have to remain pure. There's a um, parenthesis here. Uh, talking about Islam and talking about Judaism, a lot of the uh, law is pretty graphic, uh, which makes me blush. So uh, one of the ways that makes you impure is if you ejaculate. Um, that makes you impure. So if priests had to stay pure all the time. There would be no little priests. <laughs> no little Levites running around. Uh, so it's a mitzvah, a commandment, that you bury the dead, and you bury them quickly. So the priest would have uh, been impelled to take this man, and if he were dead, which he was not, uh, to bury him. That's a requirement. There is a criticism here that the priest did not do what it was required of him. So Jesus is pointing out that the priest and the Levite did not do what was required of them. They were wrong, and that's his, the point. But it is not an issue of purity. It was an issue of morality. Um, so, uh, and the priest was going down to Jericho, and Jericho is... Um, is a resort by the Red, is by the Dead Sea. When priests finish their duty at the temple, they would uh, often go down to Jericho for a little R and R and maybe a little ejaculation. <laughs> um, so everybody is pure much of the time. Uh, purity is required for certain activities. So there's not. Purity is an issue in Judaism, uh, which is not in Protestant Christianity. It's a somewhat issue in Catholicism. Uh, it's an issue in Islam. It's an issue in many other uh, traditions that have a uh, concept of priesthood. Um, so another claim is that uh, Judaism, um, the temple in Judaism, was a uh, center of power and indeed of domination and it um, abused people and it required the poor to come in and pay uh, more money than they could in order to support it and so it was <coughs> abusive. Um, one of the texts cited for this is the cleansing of <coughs> another, the widow's might. Uh, in the widow's mite story, there's no indication that she was unwilling to pay her tithe. Uh, that's not there. She's held <coughs> up as somebody who is um, a person of great uh, rectitude, great devotion to the temple, because she wants to pay her tithe, and she wants to... Um, to uh, be a faithful Jew in doing that. Jesus' point there is not that she was being abused, but that she was a great example of faithfulness. And the wealthier people who paid a much smaller portion um, were uh, tight-fisted, were not doing that. So it has nothing to do with the, with the temple domination. 
the temple was the core of redemption. Uh, in uh, the three pilgrim festivals that we talked about last time were times when people would uh, come to Jerusalem, come to the temple in throngs in order to make their sacrifices, which were redemptive. So it's like for us going to communion. You know, it's a, it's a holy activity that we do because it gains benefits for us, spiritual benefits, uh, benefits for our life. And that's what going to the temple was. You know, the Eucharist is our sacrifice. We've talked about it that way. It derives from temple sacrifice, and that's the way that was the Jewish Eucharist. So people would come and do that special service. They couldn't do it unless you lived in Jerusalem. They couldn't do it uh, every Shabbat, uh, every uh, festival, um, every time. But they did it as they as they could. The cleansing of the temple is a little difficult to understand because it happens in, it's described in different ways in different Gospels. Uh, but clearly it seems that the basic issue there, and this is one of my two claims, um, is that business, the requirement for people to uh, trade their Roman money, which had the uh, picture of the false god of the uh, Caesar on it, to trade it in for uh, money suitable for the temple, would um, that that business operation had been moved into part of the temple. Uh, this is more clear in Luke than in the others. Uh, Jesus, um, there were a succession of courts in the, in the temple, the court of the priests, the court of the Israelites, the court of the women, uh, the portico of the women, then the uh, court of the Gentiles. So there actually was an area of the temple for Gentiles. And they've actually discovered, found the stone that went in the wall, uh, which was not a high wall, it was kind of a low wall, um, that marked, that says essentially Gentiles can't go beyond this point. And, uh, but the claim is that the, they had moved those merchants into the court of the Gentiles thereby displacing the place where Gentiles could pray. Um, and that was Jesus' issue. Uh, it was not that they were doing business, it's that they were doing business where they ought not to do business. Uh, and um, the other, my proposition, more controversial, um, nothing to do with this topic, is that the cleansing of the temple was Jesus' provocation for the crucifixion. Uh, Jesus had not done anything that would upset the Romans. He had upset some of the Pharisees, obviously, but he had not upset the Romans. They had no reason to arrest him uh, until during a, high, during a festival, throngs of people, Ju uh, Romans are nervous about keeping the peace, and here he goes, goes and causes a ruckus, and he causes it in, in the temple. Uh, then he becomes a problem to the Romans. And what happens subsequently to that, to that is that he is arrested. Uh, and hence uh, begins the whole parish, passion narrative. So that's my theory. Uh, um, are Jews narrow, xenophobic, clannish? Um, in some ways, yes. Remember last time I talked about Jews uh, being Judaism or Jewishness being an ethnicity as well as a religion. Something a little foreign to us. Um, there was a time uh, around this time when Jews would accept converts. They didn't go out seeking them. Judaism is not a missionary religion, but they would accept converts. Um, and that's less so now, in part because the Christians forbid it. Uh, but Jews now do not, even though they could, do not uh, easily accept converts. You really kind of have to elbow your way in. 
so it is regarded as an ethnicity. Uh, and depending on which tradition of Jews uh, you uh, look at, they're more or less um, open uh, to the idea that traditions other than Judaism are affirmed by God. But it's clear in most of the tradition, in the tradition, uh, there was a court for the Gentiles to pray in the temple. Um, they, Ju standard classical Judaism regarded Gentiles as those who were required to follow the Noahide laws. Uh, in the story of Noah, uh, there are seven laws laid down uh, for everybody. And in Judaism, they understand, classical Judaism, is that God laid down those laws for every, all of humanity. God gave a special set of uh, uh, more uh, comprehensive laws to the Jews set apart for a particular role. That's the chosen people. They're not chosen to be better, though sometimes you can sense that in, in some Jewish uh, tradition. Uh, but classically, it's not that they're chosen to be better. They're chosen for a particular role. So we have in our society people who are chosen to fulfill particular roles. And there are certain requirements of them. If you're chosen to be a psychiatrist, you have rules of confidentiality that are special to you, that are not there for other people. Um, this, um, the idea in Galatians 3.28 is actually a little worrisome to Jews. Uh, if you say there are no Jew and no Greek, then Jews says you're essentially taking away our identity. Uh, it's like saying there, uh, there is no American or Russian. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Uh, you know, we wouldn't necessarily like that idea that the difference between uh, being American and being something else is entirely erased. So, um, so for Jews, in the way they hear this, we hear this as a gesture of openness and inclusiveness. Jews hear this as perhaps an erasure of their history and their identity and their heritage. So they don't hear it the same way. Um, but there is, let's see if I put it in here. Uh, there is a tradition in um, the in an ancient text, uh, the uh, Sefer Eliyahu Rabbah, uh, Rabbi Eliyahu that has the uh, Elijah saying that there is both the uh, Jew and the Gentile, both the manservant and the maidservant, both the, uh, what's the third one? The man, uh, I can't remember, there's a, there's a third contrast. All of them are uh, accounted before God um, on the basis of their deeds. So there is no separate. God appreciates, includes, accepts everyone according to their deeds. Not according to their ethnicity, but according to their deeds. Uh, and another question, the God fears. Uh, the God fears were Gentiles <coughs> who went to the synagogue regularly, who uh, followed much or all of the law of Judaism um, because it was admired for its ethics. But they did not become Jews. Uh, they did not undergo circumcision, which was the entry requirement. Uh, and these apparently was a significant group, uh, the Theophobi, Phobi, the God fears, um, that some of them or many of them, we don't know, then became Christ Christians because Christianity was a way for them to um, follow the ethical basis of Judaism 
without the sign of Jesus. Um, and the uh, seventh one, I don't want to spend much time on this, is the idea some scholars or, or apologists are trying to claim that when it says Jews in the Bible, it really means just those people who are Judeans who lived in that particular area. It doesn't apply to all Jews. It's um, really not a very strong argument at all. I think it's a great uh, PC argument to try to deal with the, um, the way the New Testament in some places talks about Jews. But it just isn't an, uh, an explanation that holds up. Um, just a last little bit here. Um, Mark Chagall, uh, born in uh, Steppes of Russia, uh, moved to France, became well known for it. Um, he um, used the crucifixion as a way of symbolizing and speaking about the suffering of Russian Jews. This is something that's happened in other places, and it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, and the idea is that artistically, there is no stronger symbol for suffering than the cross. And so you find artists, Jewish and Islamic, more poets than artists, uh, drawing on the symbolism of the crucifixion in order to represent sufferings that are not explicitly suffering the Christians. So Chagall has the white crucifixion here, and what you see here is um, that Jesus is, has a prayer shawl around. That's his uh, waist uh, covering, is a prayer shawl. And you have the Red Army, top left, coming in, destroying a village there, people trying to get away by boat. Here you have the menorah, symbol of Judaism, bottom center, Judaism light. You have people running away, um, a house in, uh, burning, top right. Uh, the bottom left, you have a person carrying a Torah scroll trying to save the Torah scroll. You have a Siddur, a Jewish prayer book, um, bottom right, and also a Torah scroll that seems to be on fire. Um, and so it's a very powerful representation of the pogroms, uh, massacres of Jews in, uh, in Russia. Um, you can see here, uh, this figure floating is kind of both the rabbi, um, and an angel, maybe the rabbi, the ancient rabbis uh, speaking. Uh, here are the um, people representing, taking the scroll, uh, the house on fire, um, and Jesus with um, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, King of the Jews, INRI, uh, both in uh, the Latin and the Latin letters and in Hebrew. And here is another crucifixion. He did a number of them here, and it's again wrapped in a prayer cloth. Uh, and this is a, a modern Israeli uh, artist who's drawing on the Last Supper as an image of, uh, those are all uh, soldiers in the Israeli Defense Force. Uh, and using them in an image of the Last Supper is very interesting, very provocative. Um, and what is he saying there? It's a little difficult to say. I haven't quite figured this out. But you do see Jesus figure there uh, alone. Nobody's paying any attention to him. Uh, is he the protester against the what the IDF is doing? That's been one interpretation of this. Uh, but you do see Christian tropes, Christian artistic themes being used by people in other religious traditions because it's so powerful. And so that's an interesting new relationship with Jews. Um, I have put uh, this book here. I don't know if you, any of you read it, but I am, this is a story of an Orthodox Jew, fiction, 
um, who draws, paints and proofs of uh, his mother, who is suffering with a right. leg by the father, and it's a complicated story, but it is uh, a real jolt to the Orthodox community that he draws a crucifixion, but that is the artistic theme that he can draw on to represent suffering. Okay, uh, question, thoughts? No idea. Yeah. What would I hope that you take away? Uh, one thing that I would hope that you take away is to read the um, the New Testament uh, differently, to raise questions about some of these tropes, some of these interpretations that have deep, deep roots, uh, but their roots are in making Jesus not a Jew, making him an anti-Jew. Uh, if we accept that that's not true, then we have to read the Gospel story, and to an extent Paul, in a different way. The, a lot of this, there are a lot of literature. I drew on this particular book just to organize it. Uh, Amy Jill Levine is an Orthodox Jewish woman who teaches New Testament at Vanderbilt Divinity. Uh, and so she's written this book, The Misunderstood Jew. Um, as, and I drew a lot of this from that just as a way. There's a lot of other literature out there, but this seemed to be very accessible and interesting. Uh, so you can read, read more about it in that book. Uh, because it happened much later than the text original. So the Masada happened uh, about 135, and even the latest estimates for, say, the Gospel of John are not that late. <coughs>